This is the Sunday School lesson for the Open Door class, and we're going to be studying John 5, 1 through 15, and I'm going to read the scriptures first. After this, there was a feast of Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, or withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water, and then what, whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there in that condition for a very long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps before me. Jesus said to him, rise. Take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well. He took up his bed and he walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who, were, uh, who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. But the one who was healed did not know who it was because Jesus had withdrawn with the multitude being there in the first place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. The title of our lesson is called A Lame Excuse. Jesus had come in from the city of Cana and he was going into the city of Jerusalem and it was a religious feast that they were going to be having. Now to get into Jerusalem, you have many different gates and Jesus went through the sheep gate. The sheep gate was used for when they were going to sacrifice the sheep, they would carry them that way to get into the temple. And it was very interesting that Jesus, which is the Lamb of God, who would take away the sins of the world, chose that gate to enter the city. Now, once he was inside the city, he came to the pool of Bethesda. Bethesda means house of mercy. The pool of Bethesda was discovered in the 19th century under the ruins of the Byzantine church. It's divided into two different pools. The southern pool had the broad steps and, uh, and the landings where the Jerusalem's pilgrims would gather to purify themselves for worship. And John describes it as five covered porches, which is like a patio covering, weather permitting the people could sit out there or lay out there and they would be sheltered from the sun because we're talking the Middle East here. Well, they're lying on this uh, pool, by the pool are the sick and paralyzed or withered people. And they had come to this spot because of a legend that said when an angel would go out and stir the water, that the first one that was in the water would be healed. Of course, that's a superstition. Instead of seeking out the healer who had come to Jerusalem to heal and save, they huddled around this pool and pined their hopes on just the chance that they would be the ones that would be the first one in the water. Now Jesus moved around in the midst of all of this group of people, but he was looking only for one person, and that particular man had been ill for 38 years. And it's puzzling because there are all these needy people, but Jesus went specifically to this particular man, and there could have been a reason. One thing we do know, it is not because the man was asking for Jesus' help. He didn't even know who Jesus was. 
From John's brief account, we get some hints about this invalid's character. Number one, he was old. In the Middle East, the uh, life expectancy during that day was about 35 years. And this man had been afflict afflicted for 38 years. Therefore, if it started in his childhood, he could have been somewhere 40s or 50s. So he was an old man. He was dependent. He relied on others to bring him and take him home and support him and he couldn't take care of himself, so he might have been dirty and smelly, so we might call him a smelly old man. He was also a complainer. He complained about how long he had been an invalid, and he also complained that nobody would get him to the water. He was a blamer. When confronted by the Jews for carrying his pallet on the Sabbath, he blamed the person that told him to carry it, Jesus. He was also a sinner, serious enough for Jesus to confront him in the temple after he had healed him. He was ungrateful and disloyal. When he learns Jesus' name, he goes to the the uh, leaders of the temple and he tattles and he tells them who it was. He is not thankful for his healing and loyal to his healer. He is also unrepentant. There's no indication that he accepted and acted on Jesus' rebuke about his sin. Why did Jesus choose to heal this particular man of all those gathered at the pool of Bethesda? Jesus follows the Father's clear direction in John 5, 19. Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing by himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner and utter grace is the reason that he healed the man clearly this man did not deserve what he received nor did he seem to appreciate it at any depth let's look at the scriptures carefully number one before you can change you must decide if you want to be changed Look at verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition for a very long time, he said, do you want to be made well? Now again, this is a strong question, but Jesus would sometimes question just to get us to think. In the past 38 years, this man had been a beggar, and he had lived off of the donations of other people. So if he were healed, he would lose those donations. Mm. He would also lose the pity of others. And I hate to say this, but today in some of the third world nations, parents are guilty of injuring their own children, crippling them perhaps, so that they can earn a living by begging. If this man were healed, he would then be responsible for himself. He would have to find work, and it would be a whole new world for him. Number two, if we do not change, we must decide to stop. If we do change, I'm sorry, if we do change, we must decide to stop making excuses. Has it ever occurred to you that there are some people that really enjoy complaining? When a person sees themselves as a victim of society, as a victim of their upbringing, and then they convince themselves that everything that happened to them, someone else's fault and never theirs. It's their wife's fault, their husband's fault. Oh, it's their parents' fault, oh, society's fault. Anybody can be blamed but themselves. For example, when Jesus asked Adam after he had eaten from the tree he was not supposed to, why he disobeyed him, Adam said, the woman you gave me has persuaded me to eat. Not his fault. 
When Moses asked his brother Aaron why he let the Israelites worship the golden calf, Aaron said, well, you were gone and the people made me. I didn't really do anything. I just threw their jewelry in the fire and poof, out comes the golden calf. So blame them, blame the fire. And then the, because the fire did it, I didn't do it, but don't blame me. If we wanna be changed, we must decide that we have to stop making excuses. Number three, we must decide whether we are ready to take action. Now understand this, uh, when the man was healed, he was not healed in the water. Jesus healed him. Jesus said, get up, pick up your mat and walk. Obviously, the man had a choice, trust and obey. It's a choice all of us have. I have a choice. You have a choice. Jesus motivated the lame man to stretch himself. Rise up, take up your bed, and walk. Jesus often told people that in order to be healed, they must do something. If you remember, there was a man that had a withered hand back in Jesus' day, and he told him, stretch out your hand, and when he did, it was healed. Jesus also put mud on the eyes of a blind man, and then he told him to go wash his eyes, and when he did, suddenly he could see. When Jesus says, take up, his, take up your mat, he is telling us something very important. Then, uh, if you truly want to change, then don't make provisions to go back. Burn your bridges cut off any possibility of going back. We have to stretch ourselves. We have to do something. Then in verses 13 and 14, Jesus comes back to reveal himself to the man. He wanted him to have more than just a healthy body. He also was concerned about his spiritual health. Now notice, Jesus spots the man in the temple, the man does not recognize Jesus. Jesus spots the man. Even though Jesus is probably surrounded by a great group, he still sees the man and he goes up to him and confronts him about his sin. We don't know what his sin is. It could be slander, lying, cheating, sexual sin. We're not told that. But it doesn't seem to be some kind of garden variety weakness but a serious sin. Jesus commands him to stop the sin. The verb is in the present imperative, suggesting that even then the man was continuing to sin. It's not like it was just a slip of a single occurrence. It was his way of life. Jesus tells him of the consequence, if he doesn't stop sinning, lest something worse may happen to you. Well, you might ask, well, what would be worse than being lame for 38 years? Hell, forever and throughout eternity, that is what Jesus is doubtly referring to. If there were a person who could have offered Jesus an excuse, it would have been Robert Reed of Texas. His hands are twisted. His feet are useless. He can't bathe himself. He can't feed himself, he can't brush his teeth, he can't comb his hair, he can't put on clothes by himself, his shirts are held together with Velcro because he has cerebral palsy. The disease keeps him from driving a car, riding a bike, or just going for a walk. But it didn't keep him from graduating from high school and then from college with a degree in Latin. It didn't keep him from eventually teaching on the college level. And it didn't keep him from going on five overseas mission trips. And it didn't keep him from becoming a missionary to the country of Portugal for 21 years. He moved there, rented a hotel room, and began to study Portuguese. He found a restaurant owner 
who would feed him after the crowd was gone, and he found someone to come to his room that would tutor him in the language there. Then he stationed himself daily in a park where he gave out brochures about Jesus. Within six years, he had led 70 people to the Lord. While Robert was in Portugal, 190 baptisms resulted. Let me tell you about the baptisms. Most of those were done in the bathroom in a bathtub because Robert could be put on the floor with his cerebral palsy, he could be put on the floor, and then he could reach over there, and he's the one that would do the baptizing. And these all, all of these baptisms resulted in private studies with Robert and his wife, Rosa. Many churches were established, and most of the churches remain with the local leadership in preaching to this day. He was particularly effective in nurturing and guiding young men into leadership, teaching, and preaching activities. He finds his cerebral palsy is a great way to meet people and to share the good news of the gospel of Christ. He is currently a volunteer at the John Middleton Prison System in Jones County, Texas, where he and his wife, of course, minister to the inmates and tell them about the love of Christ. His passion to others, to speaking to others about the blessing Jesus has brought into his life and showing the ways that he can take our weaknesses and transform them into the tools of the kingdom. Why? Because he chose not to offer any excuses. I ask, what's our excuse today? The story of the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda is all about grace. <clears throat> he didn't deserve anything. But it's also about repentance, too. If we try to separate grace and repentance, we severely distort the gospel that Jesus and the apostles taught. Former slave ship captain John Newton penned these immortal words. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It follows that if we now see, then we now avoid the things we used to be blind to and blunder into. Let us pray. Father, we are such spiritually blinded people sometimes. We receive wonderful blessings from you and yet respond so ungratefully. It's not just the healed man in our story, but it's us. Forgive us, change our hearts, Put in us faith and gratitude, we pray. And thank you for your amazing grace that covers all of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.